Did the title give it away? I bet it did. I was trying to keep it a secret. But by now you probably know that the new species of snake that I have here in the green room is of the Antaresia genus. Those three or four species make up the smallest pythons in the world. But I wanted the smallest actual species in the world. So I'm not going to be pulling out some monster spotted python or some gargantuan children's python. I wanted to go a little bit more rare, uh, at least as pets go in the United States, and a little bit more little. Maximum tiny! Let's do a bit of time travel, back to when I saw this snake for the first time. Hey everybody, it's past Bob. Probably 30 to 60 days in the past, is my guess. I am heading to FedEx to pick up a very special snake. I don't think I can visualize how small this snake is. This is the size box that I use to ship a baby ball python that's like 110 grams, 120 grams, something like that. The contents of this box, nine grams. I'm gonna be honest though, it feels like 10. Okay, let's take a look. Nice warm heat pack, that's great. I just see a little nose poking out. Oh, you can see it. Hang on. Let me look from this. Oh my, oh my gosh. Come on. I mean, wor worm size, but not as long as a worm. Like it's smaller than a worm. Hi there, little one. I need my glasses. I need reading glasses to be able to see this snake well. Oh, wow. My bright orange eyes. Beautiful red. Oh, my goodness. Nine grams. So this is Pip. She is not a hatchling, by the way. She hatched out at four grams. And if you do the math, that means that she was smaller than half this size when she crawled out of an egg. Hey, I think she's looking at me. I mean, she could be, Kent. Why do you think she's looking at you? She's probably sizing me up. Probably. As an adult, she'll be around 22 inches and 150 to 200 grams. That is roughly the same size as a mainland reticulated python the day it crawls out of its egg. We'll talk about her behaviors in a few minutes, but basically she acts the same as any other python who got in the way of a shrink ray gun. Rick Moranis was like, what? Do you get it? 1989 movie of the year? Nobody? Kent gets it. Anywho, pygmy pythons are from the Pilbara region of Western Australia. Antaresia prothensis is their scientific name. Prothensis because the American who first described them back in the 30s thought that they came from Perth, Australia, which they don't. They don't live in Perth. But their common name is pygmy python, but a lot of people use the common name anthill python because they often live in termite mounds. Termite mounds are not anthills. I think pygmy python is a very fitting name though, and uh, so that's what I'm going with. Making up the Antaresia genus are several species of tiny pythons, children's, stimson's, spotted, and pygmy. And just so you know, stimson's has been reclassified. They've done away with Antaresia stimsoni, and they're now just lumped into children's pythons. So stimson's are now Antaresia childreni. Uh, but basically, regardless of the scientific nomenclature, uh, here's the rough sizes. Children's and Stimson's get three to four feet. I think what used to be called Stimson's is probably on the smaller end of that. Uh, spotted can get up to five feet. They get a little bit bigger. Pygmy pythons, like this one who's crawling down towards me, two feet, less, less than two feet. They're pretty tiny. So if you want a python that's small to the max, go with a pygmy python. And if you keep one of these pythons and yours happens to be smaller or larger than the sizes that I gave, feel free to just absolutely annihilate me in the comments. You know, just let me have it. Or say something nice, whatever you want. And hit the like button while you're down there too, that'd be cool.
Hey, can you, do you think you could just stay on this wood? You're not going to, are you? This wood wasn't the best idea. You just want to explore. You want to explore the room, but you can't. I'm not going to let you do that. I'm going to try to start her at the top of this thing and we'll see what happens here. She is curious and intelligent. When I put anything in her enclosure that's new, she comes out of her hide and inspects it right away. She would rather interact with things than hide from them. Uh, when I first got her, I would put my finger in the enclosure, like far away from her. I wasn't trying to scare her like I was picking her up. I would just put my finger down and she'd come out and inspect it. And as soon as she realized it was something that was alive, she would just go right back into her hide. That's pretty smart, you know? She figures out what's what and what she's interested in interacting with and what she's not interested in interacting with. Hi, lady. You want to... What do you think of my finger now? What do you think now? Oh, still no? Okay. Well, I don't blame you. Can we, t can we turn you around so the people can see? Can we just turn you around a little bit? How about, how about this? Oh, you're just gonna... Well, that's not helpful at all. All right, we'll turn you back. There you go. And go down that wood. All right, where am I? Where are we here? You're distracting, Pip. All right, so speaking of crawling back into her hide, these are the smallest hides that I had on hand. These are, these are what I use for my smallest hatchling ball pythons. They're very tiny, but they're huge for her. They're not even a hide. They're like another room for Pip. So I had to come up with something that was a Pip-sized hide, and I used vitamin bottle caps. She uses them sometimes, but a lot of times she's just out hanging out on top. She'll hang out on top of this. She's pretty bold. Once she got used to her enclosure, she uh, got pretty bold and she hangs out wherever she wants to hang out. Usually when she's digesting food, she'll be in her little bottle cap, but otherwise she'll be out and about a little bit. Hey, Kent's Corner. Oh, you've got a Kent's Corner this week. Yeah, we can do that. Hi, welcome to Kent's Corner. This is the corner and I'm Kent, the guy who does the thing. Anyway, here's something that Bob has conveniently left out of his review. Venom. I've been learning about different types of venom. Some snake venom will stop your heart instantly. Some will melt your face off. And some will make you go slowly insane until you lose all your friends before dying of an eventual collapsed lung. We don't even know what kind of venom this snake has because Bob won't even mention it. Thank you for watching Ken's Corner. Pip is of course non-venomous. Dang it. And technically a constrictor, but I don't usually see her constrict. I think she would do that more if I gave her live prey which I won't do. These snakes eat carrion in the wild, meaning already dead animals. I mean, they eat live too, but, but if they find roadkill, they'll just start eating it. So when I give her a frozen thawed meal, she'll be like, oh, here's a dead mouse that's just floating in the air in front of me. Let me just start eating it. She'll do that. Sometimes she grabs it. She, lately, she's been grabbing it a little bit more and almost wrapping, but she's just happy to eat something, I think. I'm going to tell you what the differences are between handling Pip and handling my other snakes while we scroll the horde of keepers here on this upturned hide. One of the main things is that when I go to pick her up, I don't usually use my hands. You saw me doing that with her when she was cruising around, but she can kind of crawl onto my hand a little bit and I can lift her up. But if she's in her cage, I'm not going to reach down with my fingers and try to pinch her to lift her up. So I'm using a hook usually when I take her out and she does really well uh, just getting on a hook and riding out and then I can put her on my hand or wherever I want to put her. Speaking of where I want to put her, I want her to be able to have the same opportunity that my larger snakes have where they get to um, roam around a little bit and have different experiences. But obviously I can't have Pip roaming out anywhere, even like on the counter supervised like I do with the baby uh, ball pythons. So what I did is I bought her a display case. It's like a display case that you would have for a football or a, uh, some action figure or something. <laughs> and, uh, so it's not airtight. Uh, so she's got plenty of air in there, but I can put her in this little display case with different things like the piece of wood that she was crawling on. That's usually in there. And she can cruise around in that display case and, you know, explore different things. It's a foot high by six or eight inches wide, but it's colossal for her to uh, explore around in for a little bit. So 
she goes in there for about 20 minutes or so and gets some enrichment time and she's she doesn't seem stressed she's not doing a lot of glass surfing uh and she's not showing me signs of stress when she's in there she's just very curious and uh, likes to climb up as high as she possibly can so it's pretty cool oh the other big difference in handling her is that I am watching her all the time when she's in my hands because she's so small at this point that I can't really feel where she's at. So with other snakes, you know, if you handle snakes, you're, you know that you can do it without looking at them and you know you kind of can feel where their body is, whatever. I can't do that with her. So I can't tell if she's gonna maybe fall off my hand or something like that. So I keep my eye on her all the time when she's in my hand because I just can't feel her. Thanks so much to the Horde of Keepers over on patreon.com slash greenroompythons. Big thanks to our channel sponsors, Black Box Cages, Lane Labs, and Gray Family Snakes. Here are your discount codes in case you're looking for a cage, frozen prey items, or snakes. I'm trying something new with the log here. Let's see what happens. So once she was eating just fine, and I was confident that she would just take food from me, I started to target train her and I sacrificed one of my beard beads from the Christmas episode to make this little pip-sized target. I'm not saying that she's target trained yet with, I don't know, eight feedings or something that she's had, six or eight feedings, but she does inspect anything that, that comes into her enclosure. So it's very common that when I introduce that target, she comes right up to it. Sometimes I have to take her hide off of her to, you know, if she's in her hide, but uh, she'll come up to that target and do the right behavior accidentally just because she's curious. So she's getting to learn that, that she sees that target before she gets fed each time and she's starting to uh, be able to associate that with food. So I don't know what that means as far as, you know, I, I don't know if it's, I mean, I don't think it's necessary at all to be target training her because uh, I don't think we're too worried about food aggression with a pygmy python. I mean, she might be food aggressive, but it's not too much of a concern if she ends up biting my finger, even as an adult. But I want to target train her just because it's, you know, a fun thing to do. And I'm interested in their brains, you know. I'll tell you, speaking of brains, there is the entrance to, this is sitting on top of a hide, a, you know, obviously a massive hide for her, but the entrance to it is in the back here. And this is where she keeps going. She found the entrance to this hide. She knows that it's dark down here. And so through this whole video, she keeps coming to the back and trying to get into that entrance to that hide. Just like any other python, they find a place that they want to be and they'll continue going in that same spot each time. Right, lady? Come here. You know what you can do? How about this? How about going your hide? Here's your hide right here. Look at this. If you're trying to find a dark space, hang on, look. Just look where you're at. Just have some spatial awareness. Look at that. There's a hide. You can be right in there. No problem. Go crawl in there. That's yours too. I bet you recognize it. There you go. All right, let's continue. So far with this species, and I can extend this to the entire Antaresia genus, I recommend. They're really cool snakes. And uh, right, you know, right now in the US, you can get a children's python or a spotted python for a few hundred dollars, maybe a couple hundred dollars. They are similar to, they're all similar to each other. You know, this there's a slight size difference, but uh, as far as look, they look very similar and they act very similar. They're just really fantastic pets. Now, if you're a shirtless guy who likes to lean against your lifted truck with a giant snake around your neck, this entire genus is not for you. But if you're that guy, I doubt you're watching my videos anyway. But if you want the ultimate in maximum tininess, you might pay a little bit more and you might not be able to find them all the time, but you'll have yourself a very tiny python that is an intelligent and engaging pet. So you'll see more of Pip on this channel. We'll watch her grow up together. Hey, thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Bye.